Yeah. Okay, well we've been fed by pizza. It was time to be fed by the word of God. Try to uh, try to stay with me and let the grease overtake you into a kind of slumber through here this morning. Remember what I'm saying. Well, uh, yeah, we're going to be looking at Mark 1 together this evening. So if you've got that in the Bible or an app with you or something, that would be a really helpful thing to find as we start. Uh, let me ask you a question as you look that up. I want, I want to ponder this together for a, a while at the start. Here's the question. What would make the world right? Uh, on, on the kind of biggest scale, what would make the world right? <coughs> because obviously you only have to click on, the, on your news app or whatever to, to know that the world is broken. That the world is constantly in a state of, of war. There's war going on somewhere all the time. So historians argue about whether there was briefly maybe a period of world peace a couple of thousand years ago, or maybe several thousand years ago, or maybe never at all. Uh, but the point remains, world history is absolutely full of war and violence and murder. Then there's the injustice, lies and false witnessing and abusing power by kind of stepping on the people beneath you to gain advantage. Uh, we see it everywhere, we see it in governments, we see injustice in Workplaces, in schools, in universities, in churches, in libraries, in supermarket checkout queues, um, all the way from the uh, snack time in, in crash, all the way through to bingo night uh, in the retirement home. Injustice is everywhere. Uh, injustice seems to reign in this world, it seems. And all of this, doesn't it, comes from our own sin. War and injustice come from selfishness and greed. They come from us ignoring the creator of this world and instead worshipping the, the created. This is how the Apostle James puts it in, in James chapter 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? That your passions are at war within you. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. In another way, it's been said, the heart of the problem is the problem of the human heart. The heart of the problem is the problem of the human heart. The world's not broken just because there are other people out there, people in charge doing it wrong or something. The world is broken because every single one of us has, has started wars and, and murder one another every day in our hearts. So there's the question, what would make this world right? Well, as we come to Mark, it's a, it's a question that is very much on the mind of the Israelites in the first century, the people of God, uh, when Mark wrote this gospel. So the context is the people of God, they're, they're ruled by the Romans, pagan Gentiles, people not of God's people. Um, they, the Roman soldiers stood on the street corners, they, they mocked their religious practices. Uh, many of the Jews' own religious leaders are pompous and arrogant and self-seeking. On top of all this, the prophets, who God's people kind of rely on to hear God's words, the prophets have been hunt, have silent for hundreds of years. They've not heard a new prophecy from God in all that time. So what is God doing? That's the question. What's going on? And what will make this world right? Well, let's, let's read a bit together, shall we? Mark 1, verse 1. We're just going to read the first 13 verses tonight of the book, and then we'll kind of pick up pace considerably as we go through the rest of the sermon, and we'll get through the book in the following Ten weeks. But let's let's pray before we read so we and ask God for his help. Father, we come to your word now and we ask you to please speak to us by your spirit. Would you uh, would you come and as we've already prayed this evening, would you come and change us, show us Jesus in a fresh way tonight? And would we um, you know, with the with the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you in response. Amen. Okay, Mark 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptising in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptised by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with cow's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he 
preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptised you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the animal, and the angels were ministering to him. Verse 1, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the gospel. Now maybe, maybe you've heard that word before a lot in church and you're not quite sure what it means. Maybe you haven't got a clue. Maybe you've never heard it before. Well, there's an inscription that archaeologists uh, found written about the Emperor Augustus in the first century. Um, and this is what it said. It said, the birthday of the God, that's meaning Augustus, the birthday of the God marked for the world the beginning of good tidings through his coming. That's what the inscription said. Now the word, the word gospel is not really an English word at all. It's a translation of, of those words, the same words in that inscription, good tidings. Gospel literally means good tidings for the world. It's the same idea as that inscription. And notice how closely those, those, that wording is, the beginning of the good tidings. But Mark isn't talking about a long dead emperor, is he who's, who's you know, lived for a while, conquered some stuff, and then is now rotting the ground with everyone else. The good tidings, according to Mark, come with Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Christ and the Son of God. And here's where we're going to see this term, that that sentence kind of actually summarises the whole structure of the book, because it comes in two parts, the, the book of Mark. So the first half, chapters 1 to 8, asks the big question of identity. So who is Jesus? And the answer comes in chapter 8 when Peter, one of Jesus' followers, has a kind of light bulb moment and he says, Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. We'll come back to what that means in a minute. And then the second half of the book, chapters 8 to 15, we're really looking at what Jesus' purpose is. Why is Jesus here? Why is he come? And the answer comes in chapter 15 when, when, uh, when Mark is a Roman centurion, no less, saw the way that Jesus died and he exclaims, Surely this man was the Son of God. Again, we'll come back to what the Son of God means in a minute. In a minute. But, but notice that. Part one, we have identity. Jesus is the Christ. Part two, we have purpose. Jesus died as the Son of God. And notice that. Mark 1, verse 1. This is the good tidings of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. Mark has already highlighted for us where he's going. He's showing us the kind of two halves of his gospel in the very, very first line. And he he really foreshadows all of it in these 13 verses. Let me show you. So, uh, I'll I'll kind of do this in two halves. So, Jesus' identity. Mark shows us that already in the first 13 verses. Who is Jesus? Well, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Given NIV, by the way, it says Jesus the Messiah. Same same word, Christ, Messiah, same thing. But what, what does that mean? What does Christ, Messiah mean? Well, so in the Old Testament, Christ the Messiah is, is a long promised um, figure, descendant of King David, who, and he's going to bring God's reign, God's kingdom to the world. The Christ is the king, basically, the, the promised king. And the Christ is the answer to our question the question of what is going to make the world right? More accurately, it's who is going to make the world right? Well, it's, it's the Christ. Look at verse 2. Mark quotes Isaiah. You see that there? He actually quotes Isaiah and Malachi, two Old Testament prophets, but it's, it's not abnormal in, in, uh, in New Testament writing to kind of squish two prophets together and just kind of label it as one. But, but what, um, first of all, he quotes Malachi 3. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. That's Malachi 3. And that passage in Malachi goes on to describe the Lord coming to judge his people for their broken religion and, and their kind of arrogant sacrifices that aren't really coming from a, from a heart of love. Uh, who could endure in that day, God says, when he comes like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap? So that this is a messenger who comes to proclaim the coming judgment. 
And then Mark quotes Isaiah 40, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Well, unlike Malachi, Isaiah is a prophecy of comfort. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. So Mark's showing us that this messenger is also a messenger of comfort, salvation. And then verse 4, with these prophecies ringing in our ears, in walks into the story, John. Uh, clothed in camel hair, eating wild insects. Sounds weird, if, if you know your Old Testament, you'll know that's a kind of reference to Elijah, the famous prophet. So that's who we've been pointing to, who John is. He's the, he's the kind of ultimate prophet. He's a, he's a combination of all the Old Testament prophecies come together in one end times prophet, the ultimate example of it. He's the messenger of God, proclaiming both Malachi's message of judgment and Isaiah's message of comfort and salvation. And so what does John do? He baptizes people in the river. He calls them to repent and turn away from their sin and to get their hearts ready for someone who's going to come, someone greater than John. And so you can almost imagine if this is a movie, you know, the, the, the screen fades to black, the music kind of dies out, the sound goes quiet, and then gradually the, the camera comes back in. Um, a wide, <laughs> angle, wide angle shot of a road, with a figure walking towards us, and the, and the kind of music swells up, and verse 9, in those days Jesus came from Nazareth. Galilee. You see what Mark's doing? He's constantly pointing us to the, to the person who's fulfilling all of what he's saying. Here he comes, the promised one. The mighty one declared by John. The, uh, the coming judge declared by Malachi. The coming saviour declared by Isaiah. You might know Jesus literally means save, to, to rescue, to save. That's what the name means. Jesus is the promised Christ. Jesus is the king. That's what Mark wants us to see. And then we're told that Jesus came to John and was baptised by him. Verse 10. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open, and the Spirit descends on him like a dove, and there's a voice from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. You are my Son, declares the voice of God. Now what does it mean for Jesus to be God's Son? Well if you're used to church, your mind might immediately go to to the Trinity, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. But I don't actually think that's what Mark's trying to tell us here. So, so throughout the Old Testament, so in the book of Samuel, for example, it's, it's David, King David, who has, who has this promise that all of his sons after him, the kings after him, would be God's own sons. So at the beginning of the service, we read a bit of Psalm 2, which is actually the coronation psalm for Israel. So every new king... That, that takes the throne in Israel and has the crowns we put on the head, they read out Psalm 2. Um, this, is, this, is what, this is what the rest of Psalm 2 goes on to say. As for me, this is God speaking, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree, the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That was the hope for each of Israel's new kings, that they would, they would be God's son, that they would conquer in his name. And ultimately it points them to the, to the ultimate king, the messianic king, who would bring God's rule forever. So more than a point about Jesus' divinity here, I think what we're being shown by Mark is that Jesus is the chosen king. He's the promised son of God in that respect. He is the Christ. Jesus is the so how should we respond then? How, how would Mark expect you to respond to the coming of the promised king? Well, that's a question that Mark asks effectively repeatedly in the first half of this book. So in, in the coming chapters, the next few weeks, we will read over and over again stories of Jesus healing people or teaching with authority or calming storms or bringing people back from the dead and demonstrating his identity and his authority. And what Mark does in, in every single instance, he doesn't really provide teaching much, and there is some teaching in Mark, but what he, what he mainly does is he highlights the responses of the people around Jesus. It's as if Mark is saying, look how this woman responded, or look how that guy responded. How are you going to respond to Jesus? Well, well John the Baptist tells us what a good response would be to Jesus, doesn't he? Verse 5. 
People come to John and they confess their sin and they ask God for forgiveness. They repent of their sin, which means they turn away from it in their heart and they start walking in a new direction. And they get baptised. That's John's ministry. That, that's what he does as a messenger, preparing the way for Jesus to come. And as we begin this series exploring um, who Jesus is and why he's come, let me ask all of us, are we prepared? Are you prepared for, for when one day you meet Jesus as well? Will we humble ourselves, each one of us, and repent? Do we just kind of come along to church in the evening to enjoy the food and the friendship and things? Or are we, are we in a place where we are prepared to one day meet Jesus? Are our hearts in that place this evening? That's what it has to mean to come to God's word, isn't it? We come ready to listen and respond. So if you've ever read the Narnia novels with, uh, written by C.S. Lewis, he describes Aslan the Lion, this is a famous quote, more than once in the stories as, as a wild lion. He's not a tame lion, it says. And the point is made to the characters in the story that um, Aslan doesn't just turn up at their back and forth whenever they want him to. He doesn't show up when they want and, and say to them what, what they want him to. He is a wild lion. He goes wherever he wants, that's the point. He does whatever he wants. Well, it's the same with Jesus. Jesus is the king. It's Jesus who speaks his word by his spirit to us. And we are the ones who need to respond to him. Never the other way around. Well, this is the very end of Psalm 2, to kind of make that point, that Jewish coronation psalm. This is the very end of it. God has set his king on his hill and said, Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Kiss the sun. It might sound a bit weird, but the images of approaching, approaching this king or sitting on his throne, bowing your knees and your face to the ground, and kind of kissing his royal signet ring. It's a kind of it's a it's a humility, it's a it's an approach of, of humble adoration and respect given to one who, as that psalm says, who has the power to bless and protect his friends or crush his enemies. So Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the King. That's his identity. And, and we'll see, as I said, in the next few weeks, a heavy emphasis on that in this book. But then in the second half of the term, Mark's going to move on to think about well, what is Jesus' purpose then? Why, why is he come? What kind of Christ is this? What kind of King is this? And how should a disciple, a follower of Jesus, therefore live? Well, there's hints of that through these 13 verses as well. And we've already seen the reference in Malachi to, to kind of refine, to come and purify God's people. That's what Jesus has come to do. And we'll particularly see this when, when Jesus arrives in Jerusalem towards the end of the letter, sorry, the book. Um, he, on his way to the cross, he comes to the temple, you know the story, he flips the, the, the tables over. He has a lot to say, actually, uh, on, in judgment of the corrupt religious system and hardened hearts of the day. They're very much in his agenda. Uh, no, just even here, actually, it's interesting. If you've ever thought about this, I haven't really thought about this until I started preparing for this. John's baptizing people in a river outside Jerusalem. That's kind of that's kind of a big deal when you think of uh, thousands of years. This whole nation's religious structures are based in the temple in Jerusalem. All the worship and sacrifices happen there. But John's taking them outside Jerusalem to a new kind of baptism. It's something new. It's something removed from temple worship and sacrifice of the day. I think if you're Jewish. You read this straight away and something, something says, uh, as an alarm bell, I get it. something new is happening. Um, God isn't looking for religious do-gooders who offer kind of heartless sacrifices and arrogance and all high and mighty. He wants humble repentance, as we've already, as we've already spoken about. But anyway, there's, there's more in here than just Jesus' judgment of kind of corrupt religion. Jesus brings salvation. So he is a king... But in this book, you see that he's not just a king, uh, a kind of mighty warlord king, riding in a chariot ready to kind of smack the Romans. Jesus is the servant king. The servant king. Mark 10, 45 is a key verse, which we'll get to in November. Uh, maybe you know it by heart anyway, especially if you've done some kids' holiday clubs before. But, but Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve 
and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came not only to judge and rule as the king, but to save, to restore his people and his world. He's the servant king. And so that's why when we get to, to Mark chapter 15, we get to effectively his coronation scene. He has a crown put on his head, except it's a crown of thorns. He has a robe put on his shoulders, except it's covered in blood and sticking to his back. He has a sign put above his head, declaring that he's, he is the king, and yet it's written in mockery. Jesus is the servant king. But we see this in the introduction as well, in, in the first 13 verses. So here's my question for you. If you've ever read a gospel before, have you ever wondered, why was Jesus baptised? I mean, that's, that's pretty weird, actually, when you think about it. Jesus baptised, John was baptising people for the repentance of sin. But Jesus is perfect, right? He came to, to purify and refine people. So why does he need to be baptised? Well, on one simple level, Jesus' baptism shows that he's kind of sympathising with God's people. He's, he's come to stand in solidarity with us. And with his people. So he is baptized with them, just like them, to show that he is kind of here for them. He is the servant king. But there's something else going on as well. So to add yet another layer of kind of Old Testament meaning behind this passage, it wasn't just God's kings that were called God's sons in the Old Testament. The whole community of, of God's people, Israel, is in a few places called God's son. Here's Exodus 4, God tells Moses. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. Now think about what happened to the Israelites when they left Egypt. They went through the Red Sea. In the story, God, God split the water, rose up on either side of them, and they walked through a dry land. And they passed through the water and out into the wilderness where they wandered for 40 years, tempted by tiredness and hunger and thirst, and they grumbled there. Well, how does Mark frame the beginning of Mark's gospel, of Jesus' ministry? Verse 11, like Israel, Jesus is declared to be God's son. And then verse 12, like Israel, Jesus passes through the water and out into the wilderness. And then verse 13, like Israel, Jesus stays in the wilderness for 40 days, and there he is tempted. So we've already seen that Jesus is the new and better King David. But we're also seeing that, that Mark is trying to show us that Jesus is the new and better Israel. He has come to represent his people. To make things right on their behalf. He's, he's there to, to do what they could not in their place. He's come as a servant king. But if, if you're not an Israelite, uh, well, I think there's an extra level here as well. Jesus is, uh, Mark is kind of subtly pointing us to how Jesus is the servant king for the whole world. Because uh, he's not just a new David, he's not just a new Israel, he's the new Adam in these verses. So first of all, verse 1, you see the beginning there. What, is, what, what do you think of when you hear the beginning in the Bible, in the beginning? You think of Genesis 1, you think of creation. Uh, second, unlike the other Gospels, uh, like Luke and Matthew and John, they all start with some kind of origin story of Jesus. Don't they? Mark doesn't. It's like Jesus just appears as a fully grown man, almost a bit like Adam. And then third, notice that Mark includes a seemingly pointless detail in verse 13. Jesus was in the wilderness, and Mark was throws in with the animals. Well, why does that matter? Well, Jesus is like Adam. He's outside the garden, he's in the wilderness, the fallen world where he no longer has kind of good, peaceful dominion over the animals of the garden like Adam enjoyed. The animals are a threat to him. Jesus has come to, to restore not just the Jews, but all people. All of creation. And that's a theme actually in, in Isaiah, where the monk's quoting from. Um, the restoration of the whole earth, the new creation, that is God's plan for his people. And it's a theme that Mark goes on to unpack throughout the book. Um, pretty much like every other theme in Mark, it climaxes at the cross. So do you know who gets the second key line in Mark's Gospel? Uh, Peter twigs in chapter 8 that Jesus is the Christ. That's the end of part 1. 
part two, chapter 15, well, it's not Peter. It's not even a Jew. Um, it's a Roman centurion. The Roman centurion is the one who, who gets Jesus' identity in the end of the book. Not even one of God's people, a Gentile. Uh, this is the true king, says the centurion. Raised up in self-sacrifice before us. He gets it, he sees it. This is the Son of God, he says. And particularly when you remember that the Son of God, on that inscription, is, is a title for the Roman emperor. To have a Roman centurion say, this crucified Jew is the heir of the whole world, that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's pretty outrageously treasonous for a centurion to say. But he sees what absolutely no one else can. He sees the king in all of his servant glory. And he gets it. Jesus is the servant king. But, but that's what it looks like to respond to Jesus rightly. To rejoice with trembling, as it says in Psalm 2. Jesus is the servant king. So let me summarise then. Uh, Mark part 1, which we're going to see this term, is who is Jesus? Well, he's the king. Mark part 2, what is Jesus about? He's the servant king. He's the king of the upside down kingdom. He comes to serve his people. He came to give himself up to restore the whole world. Now, if you know, tonight has just been kind of an introduction in some ways, but if your mind is boggling a little bit from the sheer number of Old Testament references we've hit, or how far we've jumped around Mark, well, well, don't worry, because the rest of the series isn't going to be like this. But equally, good, because that was, that was kind of one of my aims for tonight, was just to get a sense of the richness <coughs> and the depth that, um, that there is to this gospel. I think sometimes we come to to passages in the New Testament and we kind of, we have no idea really what's, what's gone on before. We, don't, we read it as, as Brits rather than, rather, than as, um, rather than as Jewish people. But Jesus is the culmination of the whole Bible. Everything draws together in one person. He's the culmination and the fulfillment of everything ever. And the more you, the more you delve into that, the more you see that. Anyway, our question to start was, what will make this world right? Well, any answer that doesn't end and begin with Jesus, uh, Christ, the Christ, the Son of God, it will not hold up. Uh, it's time for one last thing. Mark's gospel doesn't end at the cross. You probably know that. Uh, there is an epilogue. So after the cross scene, the women go to the tomb and they bring spices to, to anoint Jesus' body. And they find him gone. He's not there. And they're told the news that he has risen from the grave, that uh, they should go and meet Jesus. And the gospel actually ends with these words. And they went out and they fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The end. To be continued. Mark ends on a cliffhanger. And he ends on the question of how will these people, these women, respond to Jesus? And the reason he does that is to again bring home that question. How are you going to respond to Jesus? So let me end by urging us again. As we begin this term together, the servant king has come. And he's going to come back again. Will you be ready for him? With a humble heart in repentance. Come to your king. Bow your knees. Kiss the sun, as Psalm 2 says. Let's, let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word, first of all. Thank you for this book that is so rich in meaning that the more we delve into it, the more we unpack it, the more we see of the greatness of your salvation plan written throughout the whole of history. And all culminating in Jesus. We thank you so much for him. We thank you for his, his kingship, his, his reign, his authority, his, his power over our hearts, over our lives, over sin, over death, over the greatest of enemies. We thank you for his authority to put the world right. And we thank you again for his, his servanthood as well. That he came not to, uh, not to make us serve him, but that he is so generously and sacrificially serves us even to the point of death on a cross for us. We, we pray that we would have hearts that 
and respond rightly to them with whatever's going on in our lives, you know, whether, whether, it's, um, whether it's ongoing sin in our life that we, that we need to turn from, whether it's, uh, whether it's just a kind of lackadaisical uh, not being bothered about him, whether we just sort of fall into a rut, whether we just come without really thinking about it. Father, would you, would you mould our hearts by your spirit so that we repent and come in humility to Jesus? Please would Jesus come soon, Father. We long for him. We thank you for him. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, we're going to stand again. And I'm going to take a stand. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we're going to sing. So let's, let's be on our feet.